Okay, so now, today's lecture, we're going to look at some, uh, one example of a competent, otherwise competent scientist, uh, established scientist, man who has patents in lasers, in fact, I think enough so that he was able to retire on them to some extent, but also has his foot in the paranormal camp. He was the, one of the two scientists studying Uri Geller at Stanford Research Institute when I went down there. And uh, he has done a lot of other things in the ESP world. And this is his, he thinks it may be his last book, but his magnum opus has, has just came out about a year ago. And it's called The Reality, this is the cover of his book, The Reality of ESP, A Physicist's Proof of, this, of Psychic Abilities. Uh, and uh, you notice that uh, on the top the cover here that Deepak Chopra endorses it, provides convincing evidence. I have never seen a paranormal book that I can remember in the last 15 years or so where Deepak Chopra hasn't endorsed it. He endorses everything that comes out. I, I don't believe he can read all that, but if he does, he's an amazing person. Anyway, this is the book. Now, the book is very interesting uh, from the point of view of this course as well, is because uh, this is a book about miracles, about ESP and proof, and through the entire book, which is a fairly lengthy book, uh, there's not a single reference or even hint that there are skeptics of this, or, this, or that any of this stuff has ever been questioned. Not a single one. Unbelievable. Uh, uh, so this is amazing in itself. You wouldn't know that there's anyone who's ever skeptical about this, that everyone believes this stuff. Must think the, the same evidence he has. In fact, he says that uh, right at the beginning of the book. He says, I, I, really, I, I know that anyone who reads, he, he has the experiences I've had or reads this book will obviously come to the same conclusion that it's un undoubtedly we've proved this. And there's no hint that anyone ever has questioned it. No mention of anything. I am the only skeptic of all the people at all uh, in the whole world has mentioned in the book at all, and not by him, the guy who writes the foreword has my name there, but not as a skeptic, but as someone who even Ray Hyman said that this looked pretty good to him. He couldn't explain it away or something like that in some out of context type of quote. Otherwise, not a single skeptic is mentioned in this book, not a hint that anything is even suspect, even, even far from, the dollars is presented as real proof, talking to the dead, um, um, uh, healing by prayer from a distance. Uh, all of that is in this book, it's quite amazing. Because at least, in a, even in his previous books, he, he was realized that there were people who questioned what he did. And there was all his ESP work. He, he was the one who brought you remote viewing. How many you know about remote viewing here? And if you go on the web, there are a lot of companies now that sell you for nice, you got, if you've got enough money, you can go take courses and become remote viewer yourself. What's remote viewing? You can sit or lie down wherever you happen to be and, and project yourself to anyone else, else in the world and see what's going on. And it's 100% reliable because they, they charge you an awful lot of money. It must be reliable, right? And uh, so on. So let's get into this idea of proof. To me, the most serious mistake that uh, Mr. Targ makes is that he completely confuses strength of belief with strength of proof. And the two actually are opposite. This, this is what, why we have a scientific method, why have psychology understands it. Because you know, the very same things that make you believe something are unfortunately the very same thing, I mean, that trick you into believing something are, are almost usually quite at variance with what actually is so. And this is well known, this is what, why we have the scientific method. That's why a lot of people don't like to think about the scientific method, because 
it can be very uh, disheartening. So I want to get into some of the things that are going on in this book. Um, first of all, he does acknowledge that there is, uh, that it's important to have sometimes some, there is scientific evidence, you know, what he calls, indeed, almost uh, with a little bit of hint of uh, disdain, uh, what's called, he calls a statistical proof, or empirical proof. You know, it's what's called scientific proof. And he claims he, there is stuff for, for that, but most of his emphasis is what he calls um, another kind of proof, which he thinks is just as good. And by the way, I, I know some other clever parapsychologists, especially uh, Jessica Utz, a statistician. She's a good statistician, but she and I have debated. We were, uh, we were the Blue Ribbon Committee for the CIA to evaluate their whole program of remote viewing, a 20-year program that the government was, was, our government was paying a lot of money for and, and, and running along with the research, and we were asked to evaluate it at the end of 20 years. And she and I, she was picked because she is a parapsychologist as well as being a, a statistician, and a good one. And I, uh, uh, so politically we balanced, it was a well-known skeptic, presumably, and so we both were a team to evaluate the 20 years of research that came out of that program. The program uh, consisted of three parts. There was the laboratory type research on, on remote viewing, which was done at Stanford Research Institute originally, and Targ and Putoff, his colleague at that time, were the people who started remote viewing experiments. And um, then there was the applied part of the program. The government actually had, uh, at any one time, something from nine to 10, maybe more, people, supposedly psychics, who served as remote viewing in an applied field. They were. Uh, the military could call upon them, the uh, CIA could call upon them, and the, the, the Drug Enforcement Agency could use them when they wanted to get some evidence that they couldn't get any other way. They, they, would, they could go to and ask for one of the remote viewers uh, that was stationed, they were all stationed at Fort Meade, um, to uh, lie down and, and, and project themselves to what the Soviet Union uh, plant that they want to know what was going on in there or this and that. So, so this is what was going on over a period of years, of that 20 year period. And the third thing, part of the program was the information that our government had accumulated on what the Soviets were doing in this area. And it was, we were told this was, a, I was part of a committee uh, before, at that time, and before that I was on another committee and we were told there was something, about, there was something called the Psi Gap. Uh, that the big gap was we were 25 years behind the Russians in applying parapsychology to military and uh, intelligence gathering endeavors. Well, um, put a, a Targ, uh, of course, emphasizes his evidence there that the remote reviewing experiments, by the way, the remote viewing experiments they were doing were done like this. Uh, you would take a psychic or a remote viewer, possible someone who presumably has this power, and then they found that they eventually concluded everyone has this power. They could take it, just ordinary people. But first they tried to take people who supposedly were well-known psychics or believe they were psychic. And this person would be cooped up in a room at Stanford Research Institute with one of the investigators, usually Targ, because Targ is legally blind, so he couldn't travel out uh, with, with the other tar with the team that they were going to send out. So he would stay back and be the interviewer of the remote viewer. So Targ and this remote viewer was, were, were stationed uh, in a uh, room, uh, isolated room, uh, while a, another team of investigators the target team would go out to a chosen target. There were something like 30 targets within the driving distance of, uh, of Stanford Research Institute in, in the Bay Area. And uh, the team would go, everyone's supposed to be dub double blind, so the team, on each trial, the team would go to uh, this administrator at Stanford Research Institute, and he would randomly choose one of the envelopes which had the target listed in it, one of those envelopes and give it to the target team. They would then open it up and drive off to that target. 
And given that each target was within a 15 or 20 minute driving distance, uh, within about a 20 minutes or 25 minutes, the people in the, the, the psychic and the, the, and the remote viewer in TARG and, he, and at, back at SRI, not knowing where these people are going, would, he would encourage the remote viewer to free associate, see what he thinks is the target team is looking at it, and describe the target, you know, what's going on there and so on, and write out things, make drawings. And now the team would come back, and it was very important, they felt, to give feedback immediately. So now, after the trial is done, the team would come back and they would take the remote viewer and target, and all, all of them would go to the target. And they'd match, they'd say, how well you have done, you know, and then they'd find wonderful matches. This is subjective part. They knew this was subje subjective part. So they also had the scientific part, the double blind part. They would, at the end of uh, a number of trials like this, sometimes seven or nine different trials, they would then take uh, the pro written protocols by the remote viewer and supposedly randomize them and give them to a judge and get, along with the targets. The judge would go to each target and rank order the protocols, which ones he thought was closest to this target, which one, you know, no rank and order, and supposedly the very first one they did, for example, out of nine targets, seven of them the judge hit right on, the first, mm -hmm. right on, so. They did their statistics, they reported this in the literature, and with odds of billions to one, you know, fantastic odds of this being chance, and they decided that they had established this remote viewing pretty, pretty decisively. Well, what happened was, uh, a, uh, by the way, this is a book I want to recommend to you. It's called The Psychology of the Psychic. There are two versions. Uh, one was the first edition by David Marks and uh, Richard Kamen. Unfortunately, Richard Kamen di died in between the two editions. Um, so the second edition came out, uh, I think, around 2000. It's called The Psychology of the Psychic. It's the second edition by Richard Kamen, I mean, uh, David Marks, he, he now is a sole author. But at least three chapters of that book deal with these remote viewing experiments that I just described to you. They heard about the remote viewing experiments and they got very interested and intrigued by it. And they were not necessarily skeptical at this point. So they tried to re reproduce these experiments as close as they could from what they read. And at first, they were getting these wonderful results, too. They were, when they go to the target after each trial, they could see all these matches. And they could see that this target that the guy just described was just right, just fits, they could find all these fitting things. But when they gave it to the judges, the judge was random, absolutely random. They repeated this a few more times. And they, they doing everything they thought was exactly like what Targ was doing. And they were just getting just chance results. So they said, what are we doing wrong? What are we doing wrong? And finally they decided, well, maybe they're doing something wrong. And uh, David Marks came to the United States. In fact, he, I got him a, 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 a little bit of a um, uh, temporary position at the University of Oregon. He was at the University of Otago in New Zealand. And, uh, but he came for a year and I had him at, uh, as a colleague at the University of Oregon. And all the time he was at the University of Oregon, he was calling up Russell Targ at Sanford Research Institute and said, I'd like to see your actual protocols, what, what you sent to the judges and, and, and how you did it and stuff like that. And they refused to give it to him. They said, we only give it to legitimate professionals. He said, we're legitimate professionals. In fact, we're the only people we know that try to re reproduce your stuff. And um, they said, they so use all kinds of excuses. Finally, and they never did give him there, but finally one of the judges, their major judge, gave him the protocols that he had been given and how he went about doing it. And they were surprised to find that when they looked at the protocols, there was things in these protocols that were cues, clues that could easily give it away. Because um, in one of the protocols, uh, Targ is saying to Rod Price, who's one, their major remote viewing, saying, uh, how does this seem like compared to the Mariner where you went yesterday? Well, now we know that the Mariner is not this target. It couldn't be this target. So the, it's a clue. When you judge his ratings, he knows not to put this 
for the mar mariner to target because it's already been mentioned. They, they've already been to the mariner to target. And they found other things dealing with the weather because several trials were done on the same day. And uh, then this thing about, well, yeah, you know, the weather's changed over the day, you know, since, since uh, we began these series today, you know. And uh, with that alone, he's in New Zealand now, he's back in New Zealand, he's got these transcripts. He doesn't have to go to the target, he gives his transcripts to local judges and says, no, just knowing from these, what this target thing says, how would you match them up against these, and this is the list of the targets, without having seen what the targets are, but there's the Mariner, there's the uh, uh, Palo Alto train station, and it's the Hoover Tower, these are some of these uh, targets. And there, there are people in New Zealand who didn't even know what these places were, using these transcripts were able to almost 100% match them. So they took out those clues, and now, now it's all chance, okay? Uh, so they, Talked to, they, they wrote this up and, they, and, and Targ got very upset. And so Targ hired another parapsychologist known as Targ. And so it's interesting, there's Targ and there's Targ, Charlie Targ. But he hired him to go over their transcripts and, re and edit them, all the possible cues in it, and then we did it again and it still came out significant. Uh, again, after much effort, David Marks got hold of the new transcripts, the edited ones, and found this guy didn't edit out all the clues. He didn't edit what was going on here. He left all the clues in. He edited out a lot of other stuff and left the clues in there. That's just crazy. So the book uh, called The Psychology of the Psychic, there's three chapters on these remote viewing experiments and um, how they kept messing it up. In the last chapter, in the, in the revised edition, the last chapter is called, um, just let me show you how they did it. From the psychology of psychic, and this, the sloppiness continues. <laughs> well, by the way, by, by this time, even some parapsychologists, most of the parapsychologists were deciding that these remote viewing experiments, which Tart says, you know, anyone can, can be succeed at it and do it. Shades very yellow, right? <laughs> everyone can succeed at it. And everyone has the power to do it. And their experiments, and he cites them again as, as the most compelling evidence they have from the scientific point of view. Not mentioning all this tearing apart, and then not mentioning my critique. I, I did some also found what I call the fatal flaw in their experiments. And so other people attacked them as well. And uh, none of that's mentioned at all here. So, but if you read, it's a very interesting book to read as a whole, The Psychology of the Psychic. They also get into the qualitative reasons why these people could have been believing that these guys were something they call it subjective validation. We're going to talk about, when we get in the next uh, few trials, we're going to, uh, soon we're going to talk about uh, the psychic reading. I'm going to tell you about the, why that works in psychology. Well, the psychic reading works because two things. One's called the fallacy of personal validation. That is relying on people themselves to judge whether the reading is true of them. That turns out to be the worst thing you can do to validate something. And the reason for that is what's called subjective validation. The, ph the phenomenon of subjective validation is that when you see a paragraph, and, and this is shades of the uh, suicide notes and stuff like that as well, but when you see a paragraph that you think was meant to be a description of you, something like that, you read it, you see in it the matches, you don't see the mismatches. That's the main thing they found. They call it the odd match phenomenon. Uh, and so that in any of these uh, subjective things, you, seen, you think you see what is an impossible thing, a miracle. Uh, the parapsychologist Jessica Ott, she calls it a uh, prima facie. Is that the, how do you pronounce that? Prima facie evidence? On the face of it, it's so, so real that you can't deny, you don't need statistics or experiments to do it. And uh, this is Tardman, as well. most of this book is. He does use the, the remote viewing, he also has the BEM experiments. You know the BEM experiments with the, uh, that made a big splash about um, two years ago? Uh, it made a big splash because Darrell BEM is a, a well-known 
uh, social psychologist who's famous for having made some very important contributions to social psychology. Uh, very interesting fellow, a good mentalist, a good magician, um, but also a parapsychologist. He, in his la last later years, he became a supporter of parapsychology. And uh, when he was interviewed in newspapers, and I think in New York Times even, how come a guy of you with your prestige is now willing to come out and say you're for parapsychology, you're a supporter of parapsychology? His answer was, I have tenure. <laughs> That was, he's typical of that, this is typical of him. Uh, but anyways, he came out two years ago with a uh, article that was published, first time they ever did it, in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology. That's a very prestigious journal in social psychology, the most prestigious one there is. And um, rather conservative ordinarily, but here they published an article by him that got all kinds of publicity called Feeling the Future. And in this article, it was 10 experiments that Ben had done over the last eight years in which he showed that undergraduates at Cornell University could predict the future correctly. He did the experiments. He says, no doubts about it. And it's, uh, the odds are millions to one against it and so on. And it got published uh, in, in what the New York Times and other journals played it up because here is something where this is a guy who is a very prestigious guy in a prestigious magazine publishing Somebody never, they ne never before published a parapsychological article. Here they're publishing one, a wrong one now, with 10 experiments, eight, nine experiments uh, in it. And, um, and it's getting all kinds of publicity and flack. And they quote a lot of people saying that, you know, on the face of it, we can't fault the experiments. Everything's done right, and so on like that. In fact, look, one of my students, one of my students um, who took statistics from me, um, Joachim uh, uh, at um, Brown University, he was quoted saying, I can't find any fault in either. I don't believe it, but I don't find any fault in experiments. And I'm trying to figure out a way of, of, of flunking him in retrospect from having that course, because there are so many mistakes in that paper, it's unbelievable. Uh, yet somehow four editors, four, four referees and two editors missed several, I got 96 obvious mistakes that should not have been there. Even if they wanted to, they did. They obviously wanted to publish because he's such a prestigious guy. They wanted to give him a buy. They're going to publish anything he sends them anyway. But they should at least for his sake cleaned it up and, and, and fixed up all the errors or, or made, made, made him account for that. So, so uh, I was quoted on the first page of the New York Times. He interviewed me uh, about it and uh, misquoted, of course. Uh, I mean, they wanted to make a story different. I said, this is all unbelievable and it's, uh, it, it, it's crazy. What I was saying was crazy was that the editors and the referees, because I've refereed papers all my life, I've been a referee on every major journal, I never saw such poor referee. You don't, that time you want to publish, let it be published, you don't let it go in with all, mis all crazy mistakes in it, stupid mistakes. And so I said that was crazy. So they, they, they took, made the quote look like I was saying that, 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 that Ben was crazy. I wasn't saying that at all about Ben. I was saying it was crazy the way they did the refereeing. And um, I later explained that to Ben, that I wasn't criticizing him, I, although I have even more criticism of him than I have of the editors. But I was, at that point, I was criticizing the editors. Anyway, uh, he puts that as another one of the convincing scientific experiments, the Ben one. By the way, since then, the reason you don't hear about it anymore is because it's now been replicated several times, failed replications, good ones. And at first, the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology refused to publish uh, some of the replications. Weissman was with the, and, and another person uh, was the first to do a serious replication, temp replication, found that it didn't, they couldn't replicate uh, Bem's results. But the, uh, Journal refused to publish. That we don't publish replications. Now, if you think about it, it, other scientific journals have that same tendency. You're not hearing about a lot of so a lot of major studies that get a lot of publicity. You don't hear about the fact that they no longer <laughs> they have been failed to be replicated because a lot of journals just don't like to publish replications. Well, there's a lot of pressure on them, and, he, and finally, the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology. Uh, did a year later after, with, they did publish a major replication, attempt to replicate it, didn't, that failed, okay? So, as far as we know, that has been a failure. Well, anyways, that's another 
when he gives his, his success story here and of the scientific stuff. But most of it is he's giving, as he says, which should make you believe, he's giving you stuff that's not scientific. It's one, one of the kind, what he calls miracles, uh, case histories and stuff like that. One example, for example, is Helen Duncan. She was a medium, a, 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 uh, a materialization spirit medium during World War II and a little before World War II in England. She was a very famous, uh, notorious, I'm going to put it that way, it's a better word, notorious spirit medium. Because even the National Association of Spiritualists in London, they kicked her out. She was an embarrassment to them because she specialized in materializing. You go to a seance with her, and in the middle of the seance, the, your dead one, your, your, your one your person you're trying to reach, would physically come out and come, come before you. And several times, people in the audience watching this would, would reach up and grab that the materialized person and tear the sheet off them. They were in the sheet wearing them, and it turned out to be her. Helen Duncan, several times. She's the most exposed medium in the world. So during World War II, she was doing medium too. She was bringing back relatives of dead soldiers and stuff like that. I mean, dead soldiers for the relatives. And uh, early in uh, World War II, the British, before we got into it, uh, the British uh, had only three battleships, I think. It was very, they were very low on battleships, especially. And um, one of the battleships was sunk very early on by a submarine. But as far as they could tell, the submarine had shot, sent the torpedoes and then disappeared, went, went away. And as far as they knew, the, the, they, didn't, they, they believed that the Germans did not know that their sh battleship had been sunk. And they were down to only two now. And so they did notify all the families of all the soldiers, uh, uh, sailors and people on that battleship that, 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 that were drowned as a result. Everyone got killed on that, on that ship, and they lost the battleship. They notified the families, but they asked the family, said, don't talk about it because we uh, do not want the Germans to know that they sunk our battleship. Well, soon after that, uh, when apparently no one knew, could, 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 couldn't, couldn't, because they, um, the British authorities uh, had asked the families all, but several families, they had, there were hundreds of people on that, sailors on that ship, you know, personnel, maybe several hundred. Uh, their families all knew about the ship having sunk, obviously, because they had lost their uh, family member. And uh, so there was a seance uh, that was uh, conducted by Helen Duncan, in which she materialized the sailor of one of the sailors that drowned on that ship. And she named the ship and said, and, said, and the, supposedly the British Admiralty and so on got very upset because this secret came out and she was the source of it. This is the way uh, Targ tells the story. And um, uh, so they, they used it. She was the last person, by the way, the act has been withdrawn. There was an act passed many, many years earlier, a witchcraft act. Uh, and under the Witchcraft Act, the British government did jail Helen Duncan for the rest of the war. She was in jail. She was the last one ever jailed under that Witchcraft Act. And he says it's because they didn't want her out there exposing any more secrets, you know, because they believed it. Well, I looked it up. I looked up the story and everything else. The British government did jail her. She was jailed. And she was the last one ever jailed on that act. They finally withdrew it after the war. Um, but they jailed her because they felt that she was, it was cruel of her. She was going around uh, materializing, playing upon dead, you know, the, the, the people who were you know, victims in the war, everyone in the war, you know, losing soldiers like mad, you know, that, that war at the beginning of the war. And uh, so they felt that was cruelty. So they, but there's no mention at all in uh, newspapers I could dig up, uh, British newspapers at the time and so on, of her being jailed because they thought she could get some more secret information and reveal it. And then when you go back and look at the, the, the details of how she came across this in the thing, well, this relative who knows about, it, she wants to get, find her, uh, contact her dead son who was on that ship. So she, she had access to that information, so it was no big deal there. Anyways, 
he doesn't tell you all that. It's always leaving out. He's always telling stories like that. And his, he, he, it turns out he admits he was a theosophist during his, uh, as a young youngster at Columbia. Uh, and then uh, later on, all his life, he still is a theosophist. And he believes in Madame Blavatsky, who was the founder of theosophy. And he says she was the greatest psychic of all time. And he puts her up as one, you know, one of his novel of his stories. Well, uh, I have the um, monograph, I think it was about 19, early 1900s, that was put out by the British uh, Society for Psychical Research. Uh, during the heyday of theosophy, uh, Helen Blad Blavatsky and her associates, they went to India and they built a, a, a special house there from, and they tried to build up the Indian ideas of uh, mixing up with science and stuff like that. She had a house there, and people would come to their house there and talk to the Mahatmas, as she called them. They were people in another plane in the spirit world. And the Mahatmas would send them written messages in envelopes, and they would get it. Well, they sent the uh, Richard Hodgson, who was uh, one of their uh, investigators, they sent him to India to investigate Madame Blavatsky. And he came back with a report, which I have, I have a copy of it, because I was at the 100th anniversary of the society, founding of the Society of Psychical Research. And uh, they were giving away, they were selling some extra copies of early editions of, of the, their journal. And I found one copy, one whole issue of the journal, which is, well, maybe two, two or three hundred pages on just that report by Hodgson on his investigation of Madame Blavatsky. Complete fraud. He found everything she did was a fraud. But he doesn't even mention that. Even if he wanted to fight it, at least he should mention that there are some people who think Madame Blavatsky was an absolute fraud, and there's evidence they had for it. And these were parapsychologists. You weren't uh, your every, everyday skeptics. These were parapsychologists. And Helen Duncan, it wasn't skeptics who, 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 who downed her. It was fellow psych uh, spiritualists. They thought she was so immoral that they didn't want to have it. They kicked her out of the, uh, <laughs> out of the spiritualist association. Uh, for being incompetent and being immoral. Okay, so he got lots of stories like that. I'm going to just tell you one story now, and it gets into his go back to remote viewing. And fortunately, I just by luck, I happen to have a you might want to call it a smoking gun type of thing. Uh, his very first uh, and most prominent uh, psychic that he investigated had working with him was a man named uh, Price, Pat Price, and there are three stories that he has in his book about Pat Price, which are, again, are these kinds of stories which he says, you don't need statistics or anything. These are things that should convince you. Well, one story is this, this one. One is a series where Pat Price did a remote viewing where, where they came out very highly. By the way, that's the series where all the cues were found, so that I already mentioned to you. Uh, the other two were uh, the Patty Hearst, uh, when she was kidnapped and stuff like that. Uh, Supposedly, the Berkeley police asked uh, Stanford research people to see if they can bring their psychic Pat Price up there to help out. Fine. So they brought Pat Price up there, and what Wade tells the story here is that they walked into the police station, and um, uh, they brought out a, a big mug, a file of, of, of mug shots of people, and. Pat Price flips through them. By the way, Pat Price used to be a police commissioner at one time, too. So, Anyway, but he flips through those things, and uh, he come across one thing. It's a guy named DeFries, actually, who turned out to be head of the Libera Libera uh, Simeonese, Simeonese Liberation Army, which was the, the thing that uh, kidnapped, uh, the group that kidnapped Patty Hearst, and he was the leader of it. By the way, Simeonese Liberation, uh, uh, Liberation Army was a black oriented thing, but the only black person in it was DeFries. The all everyone else was white, upper middle class people. Uh, it was just an offshoot group, but they kidnapped Patty Hearst and then, you know, the very fascinating story. But anyways, supposedly he put his finger on this guy and said, that's the guy you want, or something like that, DeFries. Well, it turned out that uh, two months earlier to that thing, DeFries had already been caught for something else, uh, and they, he had a good handle on him, and they were already suspected him. It's pretty clear that they did. And so the fact that Price would come in and, and put his finger on that, you don't, you, you don't know what was going on here, what was being said, and stuff like that. But anyway, so that's another story. And the third story is this. Um, 
And this is one of the things, amen, this is most remarkable. It's Pat Price that says it's really one of the things that, that should convince everyone. Can we see this? Okay. Okay, this is from his book. But um, this is a gantry uh, that, this is a drawing uh, of, uh, best you could tell from a, a CIA drawing, from overflights of a, a in Seni Polansk uh, in the Soviet Union, there was this a thing that the government and the CIA were very interested. What's going on there? Something was going on. They didn't know what was going on. They suspected something very important was going on during the Cold War. Uh, so 1974, uh, to test Pat Price, uh, TARG uh, was given the coordinates by someone from the CIA of something they said they were interested in and asked if uh, they could get Pat Price to remove view from the coordinates, what was going on at that plant. And according to, uh, uh, this is what, the, this thing that, that he, how he uh, talks about the diagram here. He says, above left is Pat Price's July 1974 drawing of a psychic impression of a gantry crane, that's this thing over here, uh, at the secret Soviet R&D site at semi Palant -Pala -Pala I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Showing remarkable similarity to the actual crane on the right, as enlarged from the CIA tracing of a satellite photograph taken in May 1974. Note, for example, that both cranes have eight wheels. Okay. Okay. So this is the big thing, right? He, he they give him, He doesn't know what where the site is. Or what he's just given the coordinates, and he comes up with this drawing. What do you think? Did he know what he was supposed to be looking for? Well, that's a good, a good question. Uh, supposedly, he didn't know. But uh, he didn't know it was secret, and it was supposed to be something to do with the Soviet Union. And he, you know, now you get, get into these things, very inter interesting. But it's as if, what he tells the story is as if, OK, we sit down, and he gives the coordinates, and bang, he comes up with this drawing, OK? The gantry. And look how it looks very close to it. Now, I do remember those days and those times. I remember that we were concerned about Soviets getting ahead of us in rockets and uh, getting to space and all that kind of stuff. And um, my guess would be, and this is my guess, this time that uh, knowing that uh, that this you know that the CIA and the military are interested in this these coordinates, that have something to do with the Soviet Union. We were in big Cold War at the time. And that there's always things going on, building rockets and stuff like that, so you have these, have these cranes there. And so a crane would not be that unusual. I did another thing as well. I went and looked up, if you, you can do it yourself, uh, I don't know how it is now today, but I went and looked up a crane, you know, on Google Images, put gantry crane down. Everything looks to me like, 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 like that or that, you know. <laughs> that was the same. Many of them have eight wheels. Uh, so I'm not sure how big a deal that should be by itself, okay? Because that's not the only thing. Suppose he told them a few other things. But it's just, they just sat down and had one session with him. And it was all fairly well co coordinated. And this supposedly convinced the CIA and the government to go along, give, to give a contract to, to, to the Stanford Research Institute to begin doing their research on remote viewing, which they did for 20 years, actually. And um, I was uh, called in at, at the end of the 20 years, uh, I've already mentioned this, with Jessica Utz. We were the team to uh, evaluate the 20 years of research. So when I saw this in the book, he brought this up again. I went and looked at the first report. 1974 was the first report from uh, Stanford Research Institute of the research on remote viewing. By the way, it's also the time they worked with Uri Gela there. And I have something to say about that as well. But um, I think I have, yeah, OK. I found attached, I hadn't noticed before. I went to my bar, I found these bodies. What the CIA did uh, was send uh, me and Jessica Utz three big cards. They declassified everything. Not a good job, by the way. I see they, they redact things here, but, but they forget to do it some other place. So I always can tell what they're talking about and who they're talking about. 
So, uh, so whoever does redacting these, these documents, they must have been very tired or something because they, <laughs> they did it overnight. But anyways, I have three cards like this that were delivered to me, this size, like this, uh, to my house, and I have them still in my storeroom there, with documents all dealing with the 20 years that, of research and everything that was that generated during that uh, 20 years with the program of the remote viewing and our government using it. Well, attached to this document was this hand-typed uh, thing. I'm just going to give you, the, I just brought the executive summary for you. The, apparently, uh, the government hired an independent investigator from another national laboratory, an expert, to evaluate this, pro this uh, remote viewing protocol, see how accurate it was, and how close it would be to, uh, how useful it would be for the CIA purposes and military purposes. So let me show you, give you his uh, executive summary. Uh, this is as it was attached to the thing. It's a copy. You know, he, obviously, it's redacted. It says summary. By the way, this is a 30-page report, and this is his executive summary of the report, whoever this particular person is. But he's from one of the national laboratories. He's an expert. The remote viewing experiment, and let's get that title there, proved to be unsuccessful. Okay, that's right, it means, but that's his first stat sentence in his executive summary. This conclusion was reached only after a careful review of the tape recordings, tape transcripts, and sketches that were generated during the four-day experiment. You only hear about the first day from Targ. Four days is what on, okay? Uh, and things weren't controlled over that time, who we talked with during that time. He was able to go home and talk with people freely, other people from the government, so who knows what was going on? That's what's controlled. During the first day session, S1, that's Patrick Price, and later, if he gets redacted out, accurately described the location and type of target that information had been given to him by the experimenters, <laughs> <laughs> but failed on the layout and types of buildings. Saw a gantry crane for heavy lifting, Tended to spend too much time on specifics only to say, I'll come back to that, but seldom did, and successfully evaded drawing a perimeter of the area, even though he was asked to do this twice. Therefore, nothing positive to validate remote viewing resulted from the first day session. By the way, you only hear about the first day session from Tari. You wouldn't know there's more than that. Uh, Price was contacted by phone that evening by one of the experimenters and was told to concentrate on the crane and its relationship to the dominant three-story building, that's building one, that he hadn't seen during the days of session. He was also told that they wanted the drawing of the perimeter fence. On the second day, S1 supplied the most positive evidence yet for the remote viewing experiment with a sketch of the rail-mounted gantry crane. It seems inconceivable to imagine how he could have drawn such a likeness to the actual crane at, unless he actually saw it through remote viewing or he was informed of what to draw by someone knowledgeable of that site there, they call it. And there's just one, a little bit more than one more page left, so I'm able to see what The second possibility is mentioned only because the experiment was not controlled to discount the possibility that he could talk to other people. Uh, Price commented that he was seeing, I'm sorry. Oh, thank you. I, I'm not even looking, I should look at that. Right? Uh, uh, let's see. Price commented that he was seeing a lot of things this, this second day that he hadn't seen the previous day. In fact, he mentions seeing several land, land type, landmark type objects that simply did not exist. One explanation of this discussion, discrepancy could be that if he mentioned enough specific objects, he would surely hit on one object that was actually present. This could explain the inconsistency between his most positive evidence of the experiment, a sketch of the rail-mounted gantry crane, and the larger number of objects he sees that, in reality, are simply not present. This discrepancy between what Price sees and what is really there certainly would make it difficult for the eventual user of his remote viewing data, since he would not know how to differentiate the fact from the fiction. At this stage of the experiment, the data is inconclusive to validate Price's capability of remote viewing. He goes on in the same vein, I won't read any more, but what you learn from this is important, is that you don't hear about this, but who obviously, obviously uh, Todd at some point was in possession of this report because it was 
to a final report that he put in, so this was appended to it. So you wouldn't know that, at least he should mention that there was at least a, a, an important person in the government that the government hired to evaluate this thing and came up with completely opposite conclusion from him. Um, was this before or after you did your report? What's that? Was this before or after you did your report? Oh, you mean after I made my report? Well, my report was on a whole, whole program as a 20-year program as such. Uh, that was then, uh, this book, this thing he's writing now, this book is well, well after. No, I mean, the other guy who... Oh, no, that was before. Oh, that was before. That was early. That was, that was 1974. That, this, this was their first report. They had to give reports, you know, they were being funded by the government at that time, the CIA, and they have to give uh, annual reports. And this was their first report, 1974 was their first report. And attend, attached to their, for their report was this uh, uh, statement by the uh, special independent investigator. And you would think he would at least mention that. He doesn't mention that it was four days and, and that nothing worked out and, and it was only, the, one, the only thing that seemed to be right was the gantry. And I'm not, I'm not impressed with that, but um, uh, scenes like that he doesn't mention. And so... What's that? I'm wondering why the government kept paying for it with reports say Well, that. you know, there were two interesting uh, reactions. I was on the Larry King Live show at that time. There was a good on this, and, uh, and people were saying, uh, you know, uh, the government wasted $7 million of our taxpayers' money, the military did. Well, first of all, the $7 million comes from me. I was the one responsible for saying that. I checked with... Um, uh, uh, May, uh, Ed May, who was, who was the successor to Tower and Putoff and still running remote viewing experiments. First at SRI, now he's in another place called SAIC, and then maybe the program's been closed now. But I checked with him and said, how much total money did you get? He said, well, I don't know, but over a certain period of time during, when we were doing these experiments, it was $7 million. So I mentioned that, happened to mention that on the Larry King Live show for some reason came up. And ever since then, that's been the fixed mark. This is the way things get in, into the public uh, eye. Um, it's amazing how things get fixed that way. So every time I read about the, uh, hear about this remote viewing, you get two views. One, that the government wasted $7 million of taxpayers' money on it. The other view is that this must be very important because the government spent $7 million on it. It must be something to it. Why would the government do that? I checked, I did a calculation at that time. I found that one, $7 million was like, one tenth of a percent of the of the military budget for 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 uh, for, for only a year, you know. So, it was, if in terms of our military budget, that's insignificant, really. Uh, but but people make big deal, two big deals. They should still, I still hear about it, and I, I wince because it's just like that statement about that we only use two percent of our brain, and uh, Barry Biasin and other people have been checking that out, and it goes way back to no, but that's crazy. Who knows what, what we use 2% of our brain. Our brains always work all the time, and that 2% is just nonsense. And um, another thing like that, but the, these things get fixed. I was uh, once um, got a call, as I usually do, so when people got a question, but someone called me at, at the university and said, from New York Times, and said, um, uh, you know, we have this, every week we have the Science Times, and people can write in and ask questions, and we try to give them answers, get to go to the experts. And someone wrote in about deja vu. So we want to know what you have to say about deja vu. I said, well, I don't have anything to say about deja vu. I'm not an expert on that. That's not my field. And I, so I told them about uh, a good psychologist to go to who's an expert in it. I, I, I referred to him. And you know, just reporters that can be lazy like anyone else and cognitive misers. So he said, yeah, yeah, but what would you tell your students if a student asked you? I said, well, if a student asked me, this is what I would say. Well, next thing I know, it didn't go to anyone else that, that they quoted me. This is what Professor Hein has to say about deja vu. And even today, I still see I'm the expert now on deja vu, and this is what I had to say about it. <laughs> I know nothing about deja vu. I know what, what the textbooks say. That's about it. And um, you get fixed in that. I become an expert. Yes, I get 10 more minutes. Good. Okay. So what to make of this? Well, one thing is this brings up the issue of what we call uh, vividness. 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 Yeah, vividness. It's a, another thing that the same psychologist who did that experiment on belief perseverance 
about the same time they also did experiments on vividness. The idea of vividness is that, uh, let me give you an example. Let's say that you want to buy a new car. And you get some, so you go to consumers' reports, you look at their automobile issue, you look at the ratings of the automobiles, and you decide you're going to get this Ford Explorer or something like that, okay? Because it, it fits all your needs, the price is right, and it, all the ratings are, are just right, okay? And just before you're going to go to buy your Ford Explorer, some friend says, oh, don't you want to get a Ford Explorer? I have a friend who got it and it was a lemon. At this point, that's the end of the Ford Explorer. Okay, that, what this says, what, notice what this is going on. One, one point, because it's vivid, it's a story, it's a personal story, overrides hundreds of statistics. And this is the idea of vividness, that they find many situations where, uh, so a story like, uh, like uh, this crane thing like that, uh, it, overrides completely the, the, all the statistical stuff, all the other stuff you have about it, you know, stuff like that. So the idea of vividness is that a story can outweigh a, a accumulation of statistical and other information. And so we will, we now have a background of why it's necessary to have some way of overcoming all these pitfalls that we've talked about. And uh, so the next lecture, we're going to begin with the framework which I hope will help you think in such a way that you won't be as tempted as your mind wants to be tempted and we untempt you. <laughs> <laughs>